This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to the Mann Library of Jackson the Stacks Book Talk Series. In today's talk, originally presented at Mann on March 26, 2009, Professor Emeritus R. K. Horse discusses the history and newest edition of Westcott's Plant Disease Handbook. Dr. R. K. Horst, Cornell Professor Emeritus of Plant Pathology, discusses the seventh edition of this classic work, pointing out current issues in the treatment of plant diseases, the regulation of pesticide use, and the problem of spiraling costs in the publication of high-quality science reference materials. Dr. Horst also shares some thoughts on the life and work of plant scientist Dr. Cynthia Westcott and her pioneering work in providing science-based guidance on plant care. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So I can wander around now. I don't have to stand here behind this podium now, which is very good. I thank the library for inviting me to talk to you about uh, the plant disease handbook. Uh, not only am I going to tell you a little bit about how uh, what all is involved in the plant disease handbook, but I'm also going to tell you a little bit about background about the Plant Disease Handbook and its initiation and how it all started. And I'm also very pleased to see at least half of the audience here are females because uh, I have a special story of interest to tell, to tell you ladies who are in the audience. And it relates to the Plant Disease Handbook, believe it or not. <coughs> the Plant Disease Handbook started its first edition in the year 1950. Uh, I, I could say that was before I was born, but it wasn't before I was born. <laughs> it was actually, I was still in high school at the time in 1950. But uh, that was the first edition, uh, the date that the first edition came out. And the book uh, was uh, published by Van Ostrom Publishers. And the author of that book was Cynthia Westcott. Cynthia Westcott uh, was an individual who got her degree here at Cornell. Now, she not only got a bachelor's degree here at Cornell, but she got a doctorate degree at Cornell, at Cornell, in 1932. 1932, women coming out with doctorate degrees in sciences, including plant science, there were no jobs available for women in those days. Okay. Her, one of her uh, favorite professors was, of course, Wetzel. And, um, after she finished her degree work, she started initially in, in uh, working, preparing laboratories for courses taught here at Cornell University. And she did that for a number of years. And uh, she would prepare the specimens. Uh, she would prepare the, the, the things that cause diseases, like the fungi and the bacterial uh, uh, pathogens, as well as uh, nematodes and things like that for class use. And at that time, when she was doing that, the, the prep labs in the, in, the, in the department was located in Bailey Hall. And uh, Bailey Hall, whenever the organ played, Cynthia Westcott said, all the dust came down with the shaking of the <laughs> and it contaminated the cultures. So it was not an easy job to do those kinds of lab preparations even in those days, but she did it. And Wetzel uh, finally advised her, why don't you go out and start up and out your shingle? And she did so. She went out and started up uh, a, a business of diagnosing diseases. And she traveled all over the United States doing that. She became very well known. Uh, she had a partner at one time who was an entomologist who got her to be also at Cornell. But uh, uh, she then tied in with industry, and Cynthia Westcott was left, left alone to do this job of uh, plant doctorate, and she did it, and she did it very well. She did it well enough that she became well enough known that she had some rather famous clients, one of which was Wasman, who was the developer and discoverer of streptomycin. He, he was one of her clients. <clears throat> she also ran disease clinics in Macy's and Bamberg down in New York City. <laughs> clinics. Believe it or not, that people came and were interested in how do you identify these things that are making plants sick. 
she uh, she uh, carried on. She cut. She uh, did a second edition of the book, and then finally a third edition. Her third edition came out uh, in the seventies. I think the early seventies. <coughs> The publisher was still, was still Van Ostrom, and uh, at that point in time, as a matter of fact, when I was in college, uh, I bought uh, Cynthia West Class Magazine's handbook as a reference book and made use of it. And then I came to Cornell. I came to Cornell in '68, as Marty already described. And thank you for being kind to me, Marty, and not telling everything you know about me. Uh, um, but in the mid 70s, I came here in 68, and so I was still a rather young professor. And um, Cynthia Westcott was getting up in years. I had never met her. But for some reason or other, she tapped me to be the person that would take on uh, the authorship of the uh, Plant Disease Handbook. And uh, Ben Ostrom contact contacted me, and much to my surprise, I never expected something like that at all. So I suggested that uh, I'd be willing to take a look at it, but I wanted to meet with her as well as with um, Ben Ostrom. So we met at her home. She was getting well up in years at, at that time, and her health was failing, beginning to fail her. And so we had a really nice meeting with Cynthia Westcott. Out of that meeting, uh, uh, I, I learned many things just from that meeting alone. The book, the Plant Disease Handbook at that time, the third edition, 1970s. How much? Twenty-two fifty. Twenty-two fifty. Okay. <coughs> and when we finished our meeting that day, Cynthia Westcott asked Van Ostrom what uh, uh, what would this what would the fourth edition sell for? And uh, they said probably thirty-two fifty. And she said it'll never sell. It's too expensive. Well, I'm not going to tell you what they're charging for it right now. Not until the end if you ask me what they're charging for it. But I, I took the process on, and I was absolutely stunned in, in uh, taking on this project. In the, the late 1970s, uh, you, know, we, you know what computers were like in the, in the late 70s. <coughs> you put up a whole room, and you used punch cards. Remember, remember those days, Marty? Some of you may not remember those days. Some of us do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it was a lot more work to do a book of this size. Matter of fact, this is the first edition right here. And this is the seventh edition, as Marty showed you. So the book has grown. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that growth has, has taken place so that you can understand what is involved with the book like this. But it was a little bit overwhelming to me when I started in on doing that revision. Because I, I, although I used the book as a reference book, I didn't realize all the work that, that goes into putting a book like that together. It's, it's, it's not something that you do overnight. Matter of fact, we started this seventh edition. That seventh edition was started in 2000, 2005. And it came out in June of 08. So even in this days of computers and uh, you know, all the, all the things that we have to help us in computers today. And I went through it with the various editions that I've done. First of all, basically no computer. Second of all, we had floppy disks. And then the third, third, third one that came along, and then we had uh, CDs. And now look what we got. These little, uh, yeah, little disks. And not only that, but now we have a book. Now we have an edition of the book. It's not only in a hard copy, but it's in e-reference, which I, uh, the library has in the e-reference. We have the e-book. Yeah, the e-reference portion. Okay, now let me tell you a little bit about what, what, what's, in, what's in this book. There, there are four basic chapters in the plant disease handbook. And, and actually, when I, when I took it on, I said I would take it on with the, with, with the agreement that Westcott's name would be associated with the book because she was the one that initiated that book. The first chapter basically is on garden chemicals. And the garden chemical one, chemicals have been modified greatly over the years. And uh, certainly to cover all the chemicals that are available for garden use. I more or less have uh, gone to, to 
looking at more the ones that not only are effective ones, but the more the more uh, the safer ones, because pesticides have toxicities and toxic materials have been used in the garbage for years. And people have to watch it and use it around their children and around their animals and pets. <clears throat> so the first chapter deals with garden chemistry. The second chapter is basically classifying plant pathogens and uh, all the taxonomic changes that happen with the pathogens that are involved in uh, causing disease in the plants. Now think about this a little bit. Just think about it. It's those changes. Not only are the changes in terms of new diseases happening, new pathogens coming on the scene, and that constantly happens, all the time it's happening, but some of the old pathogens uh, going to cause disease on new crops that they've never caused disease on before. And so those are all identified in the modifications and the new additions of the book as they come out. Not only that, but the, the names even the names of the pathogens change. So we constantly have to keep up with the new names in the mycology area, the new names in the bacteria area, not only the fungi and the bacteria, but also the nematode classifications have changed over the years and continue to change. As people learn more about these, these pathogens that cause these diseases, plus viruses. Now viruses, it's not only viruses, but uh, Mycoplasma, which are now phytoplasma, they used to be mycoplasma, now they're called phytoplasma if they cause diseases on plants. We have viroids, which is an area that I've worked on in my research, which are kind of spin off of viruses that cause some rather severe diseases on some plants. So those are included. Constantly changing, it's a changing world, diseases constantly change, plants change. New varieties, new hybrids, some of which are resistant, some of which are not resistant. And even resistances change. Some of which were originally resistant are no longer resistant. Pathogens, because the pathogens themselves change. So the classification was a nightmare at first for me. <laughs> and I thought, why did I ever take this on? <laughs> And then there's chapter three, which, which describes diseases. And in chapter three, <coughs> I think it's rather helpful in that the, in the chapter three groups of diseases according to common names. And then along with the port common names, that, uh, that gives the scientific names of the pathogens that go along with those particular diseases. Common names, there's 40 types of common names that are, are listed in, in, the, in that chapter three. And then, and those are such things as blights, Rachnose, wilts, different kinds of wilts. And, and, uh, as, and the scientific names that go along with them. Now, there's more than 4,000 different types of disease pathogens there. Diseases. And then finally, there's chapter four. And chapter four lists all the various host plants. And that's, I guess, it early on started out for mostly ornamentals, vegetables things that are grown in home garden areas. But now it's expanded out beyond that to field crops. Some field, uh, field crops are included, fruit trees are included, berries are included, uh, uh, vegetables, nuts, nut crops. So all of these are included. So this is how the book has grown over the years. Uh, fascinating. And after it's done, fun. <laughs> While you're at it, you wonder whether you're having fun. Uh, but it, 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 it's a lot of work. Now, somebody asked me, um, I, I want to leave some time for questions and discussion and things like that. So, somebody asked me, well, incidentally, the, the seventh edition came out in uh, June of 08. Since the seventh edition, we had to stop taking uh, new reports. Uh, we went through 2006. Since 2006, there have been, and I keep counting these, I keep records of them, I keep card files of these, 
there have been 289 new reports through April of this year, new disease reports, since the end of 06. 289. I, at one time I thought we were averaging about 100 a year, but now we're, we're exceeding 100 a year, and new disease reports coming out. That's not new pathogens only, but it's new reports of old pathogen on new plants and new hosts. So it's constantly changing the atmosphere. You know? it's really, you just have to keep, just to keep up with it. It's, it's helpful for me that I keep a card file as I see these things being reported, because then it's easier to uh, put, it, uh, put it into a new edition. As a matter of fact, I wasn't going to, I was at the point where, since I had retired, as Marty said, in 19, I have other activities that I have considered strongly that the seventh edition should be done by one of my former students. Who, uh, <coughs> he agreed that he would do it, but Springer became the publisher and Springer urged me to do it, so I did it. And uh, I had excellent, excellent secretarial help at Cornell, which I'm absolutely thrilled about having somebody like that who was really great in helping me out. Um, we need to have good sources. Now let me tell you one of the things that has become more of a problem as far as just this classification changes in, in fungi and bacteria and nematodes and even in viruses. I used to be able to, as a source, of keeping up with those kinds of changes and going to somebody within our own department of plant pathology somebody worked those areas and was uh, taxonomically involved in, in pathogens. And so they could review all those various areas. If somebody in mycology, there still is. But uh, right now, we don't have a nematologist. So I have to go someplace else to find somebody who will review that area for me. Uh, viruses is kind of a problem. Uh, also, nematodes are a problem, as I said. Bacteria are a problem, so I had to go outside of Cornell to find somebody, and it's even difficult to find somebody outside of Cornell anymore that, that can help you with those, or you have to do a little bit of searching, but we do find them. We do find them. And without that, it would be very, 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 very difficult. Now, before we, too much time gets away, I want to tell you a little bit more about I want to tell you a little bit more about Cynthia Westcott. She passed away in uh, 83. Uh, but she has turned a lot of uh, information that she collected over the years, which is of historic importance. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about some of those historic things that she had turned over to me, and some things that I found out about after receive these things, but they are things which I intend to put in the Cornell archives. That's where they belong. They should be there. Uh, we had decided that at that time that we would set up a, uh, she had donated her portion of the royalties to, to, uh, to Cornell. And uh, I had decided that, uh, that the thing that should be done with it should carry her name so that it didn't get lost where the monies came from and how they were used. Uh, we decided to put them into a fund that would uh, uh, provide support for bringing speakers to the campus in disease, in plant pathology area. She agreed to have her name go along with it as long as uh, it included Wetzel's name as well. So we have the Wetzel Westcott Lecture Series, which I'm currently And the lecture series Usually when those lectures come on campus, where are they held? They're held in the Wetzel Room. Uh, do you all know where the Wetzel Room is? Do you know the story behind how it became the Wetzel Room? No. I'm going to tell you the story of how it came to the Wetzel Room. When we were putting together this, these, this, this, these monies that were coming in from the royalties and putting it into a fund that would support bringing speakers to the campus, I came across a story while I was doing this, uh, setting this up. We had a committee. We pulled this story out that there had been a, there, there was a, uh, an article that was written by Wetzel 
that appeared in the American Agriculturist, which is published out of Ithaca. I think it still is published out of Ithaca. I'm not sure. Yeah, it was for a long time. It was for a long time. Anyway, this story I came across because I was working on this this fund uh, uh, for Cynthia Westcott's name in her honor. And the story that Wetzel wrote was a story for high school students. And <coughs> at the end of it, he listed 10 questions. That if they could answer all 10 questions in the affirmative, there is no reason why they should not go to college, regardless of how much money they have. And one day, there appeared at Wetzel's doorstep this young man who had this article under his arm, and he was interested in hotel school. And he had $30 and some odd cents in his pocket. And uh, let's just took him down to the hotel school and helped him get uh, scholarship support. <clears throat> Brought him back to his home, which was down here uh, off the, close to campus. And said, uh, and he said, how much you got in the bank? The student said, I don't have any in the bank. And he said, well, how much can your parents help you? And the kid said, my parents can't help me at all. Because he said, he said didn't you mean what you wrote? This is it. This is all I got. This was in the early 40s <clears throat> when this happened. And so let's just said, OK. He said, you can stay here at my house. And uh, I'll provide food and lodging for you. And, uh, and I'll loan you $500, providing you promise when you finish school that you'll pay back the $500. So the kid said, OK. He finished degree from the hotel school, and he went out and set up Burger King. <laughs> and paid back the 500 bucks. <laughs> the name was James McLemore. So I contacted the dean after I pulled up this story, and I said, I'd like to see whether I can get a hold of this James McLemore. It turned out he, at the time, was uh, chairman of the board of trustees at the University of Miami. <clears throat> so Dean Call said, go for it. So I, I, uh, sent him a, I sent him a letter, told him what we were doing uh, and, uh, with this fund and uh, was, uh, having Wetzel's name associated with it because Wetzel had helped him. And he called me on the telephone. And I told him what we were doing and he said, uh, well, he was very interested in helping out. He said, the story is a true story. And, uh, <clears throat> but he said he would like to do something other than just contributing to this lectureship fund. He said, talk to the dean and ask the dean what he could, what, what he could do. So uh, the seminar room, which wasn't the Wetzel room at the time, really needed renovation. I don't know if you remember what it looked like. It didn't look like much. <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think he contributed, I think, $200,000 to to renovate that seminar room, providing it carried the name Wetzel. Thus it became known as a Wetzel room. And he came here for the dedication. He was a great person. He brought his wife and two grandkids with him. And uh, I think uh, they had, uh, and Cornell rolled out the red carpet for them. Uh, they had uh, Dean of the College of Agriculture, of course, and the Dean of the Business School, and of course, the Dean of the Hotel School, all kind of a nice banquet. And uh, of course, the kids could have gotten a ticket to win the Cornell right then. <laughs> and there been three, three colleges fighting for them, basically. Um, and then one little spin off after the story, I have to tell it. And he told me that having stayed with Wetzel, he got interested in flowers himself. And he had a, 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 a large flower garden in, uh, outside of Miami, and the specialty was bromeliads and orchids. But he had, of course, he had gardeners. I think it was a 25 acre garden. <laughs> and uh, I think it was a couple years after he had left here, he sent me in the mail an article that was done in one of the National Gardening Magazine that showed uh, he featured his gardens, and it was all in color. And he said, I thought you might be interested in this because I worked with Thorne Mills. And he said, when you finish with it, uh, thank goodness the dean is in here. 
He said, send it to the dean so that he knows that I'm one of him or something. <laughs> 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 I did. I sent it to him. I sent it to the dean. And Paul was, or uh, Matt Moore actually became, uh, he got the Entrepreneur of the Year Award so, uh, a year or two after he had been here with uh, this dedication. And, uh, and then I think he contributed a bit more, a uh, good amount more to the university after that. Uh, all because of Cynthia Westcott. Okay. I'm open for questions. Do we have time for, for some discussion? I was wondering if that's the story about the Wetzel meeting is true, that, uh, that little yeah. that I yeah, it's a, true, it's a true story. There is a Wetzel leaf. It's become a kind of a noxious plant. <laughs> I don't know why they called it the Wetzel leaf, though. But basically, I don't know the full story behind it. Any other questions? The idea of a plant doctor, it seems, do we, are there plant doctors anymore uh, around? It seems like it would be a, a great thing to be able to have somebody where you could come with your, I mean, I know that there's the ex extension. Interesting that if you should ask yeah, that. Yeah. And incidentally, I have something, I have a, a CD for you. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, one of my former students, I think, which you know, named, uh, Bob McGovern, oh, yeah. gave a seminar here uh, just a couple weeks ago. He was a former student of mine. One of which I'm very proud of. I have a number of students I'm very proud of. <coughs> and he did an extra, excellent job on the seminar. He is, he is at the University of Florida. And the University of Florida has now a program. It's a Doctor of Plant Medicine program. And the program requires the students to not only uh, be educated in uh, plant diseases, but also insect diseases, and also in uh, uh, regulatory areas, and it's been very successful. It started up, I think he said, in 2003, and they've had, I think it was, as I recall, 47 or 48 graduates from the program already, who have none of which have had any difficulty in the job. Some are with uh, consulting area firms, some of them are with uh, large plant companies, some of them are with uh, government regulatory agencies, so they've been very successful in, uh, in, in getting positions and the program has, um, I guess, worked very well. So there, and it's now been, it's being developed, a program like that is being developed at the University of Nebraska and also in the s several universities abroad that are, that are beginning to start programs like this. But I'll, I'll send that CD to you. So it's a DVD, it's not a CD, it's a DVD. And you can't play it in a you can't play it on a PC. You have to, if you play it off a computer, you have to use a, a Mac. Okay. Either that or a DVD player. But I'll send it to you. But, uh, Bob was very excited about the program. There were a number of students that met with him while he was here. And the last of which was over in, um, met with it uh, the morning before he left uh, here, over in Wild Hall and uh, in a biology area. Turned out the young, the young lady had attended his seminar, and she had already applied for this program before, get doctor kind of medicine program. So yeah, there's, there's, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a, a new twist on how you train people in plant medicine, basically. You already said you were going to tell a story about the tulip. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll show you some pictures if we have time about this. I'll put later. I haven't had time to show you. Anybody know the name of this tulip? You ever heard of Rembrandt tulips? Rembrandt tulips, where uh, this is a Rembrandt tulip. They became very famous back in the, I think it was the 1500s. Uh, basically, the Dutch were really pushing them. They, were, they discovered these tulips, and they were, they became so valued that they were included in dowries and things like that. They were very expensive tulips, but they became quite popular in terms of the reason they're called Rembrandt tulips where the painters painted them. Unfortunately, one of them wasn't Rembrandt, but they, they call them Rembrandt tulips anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but there are other Dutch painters that painted pictures of these tulips. Now that is a disease, a tulip. Why? 
it's a virus disease on turtles. It's a beautiful disease. <laughs> You've heard plant pathologists call diseases beautiful. You wonder, why do they call it beautiful? It's a beautiful disease. But it's the oldest known, almost the oldest known disease on record. Now they, they breed for these stripes. But they still, there's still a Rembrandt tulips in it. So, diseases have been popular for long, long periods of time. Now, I was going to, were there other questions? Was there anything else I promised I'd talk about? Yeah. Cindy Westcott was a pioneer. She was truly, she was truly a pioneer. She probably did something that many of us never do. That took a lot of, that took a lot of courage in, in 1930s to go out and start your own business. And uh, she became very popular and well known, like I said. And, uh, this is a book on pioneer women in plant pathology. And uh, I have a chapter in here on Cynthia Westcott. So sometime, if you have a chance, read this chapter on Cynthia Westcott. Uh, she, yeah, it, it was a, it was a risk, risky thing to do, basically. As a matter of fact, she, she, she became so, so good at it that she was being called on now to talk uh, across the country, but she traveled all over the country helping people with the problems that they have. And, uh, and she uh, made a living on, on doing it. <coughs> um, <coughs> it's one of the story I want to tell about, about her. Um, it's really just like that. <coughs> but she ran these clinics. You'll be, you'll be fascinated by some of the pictures that, that are included in it because she passed pictures on to me. Shows her spraying her plants, dusting her plants. Is she here at the same time as I would guess so, yes. Yeah. Shows her spraying equipment in the, in the, in the, carrying the trunk of her car and dusting equipment. She didn't wear very much in the way of protective clothing. Mm -hmm. They didn't know about it. Did. No, nobody did. Uh, oh, I know what I want to, I want to tell you about her. <coughs> I didn't go make use of that over here. <coughs> but one thing that has not changed in this book it's a, it, it includes a lot of pictures, a lot, a lot of black and white pictures, a lot of color pictures. I'll show you a few of these. It also includes, yeah, <laughs> line drawings. These are microscopic views of uh, pathogenic fungi, the spores that are produced. She did all the hand drawings on these things. And there's a lot of these hand drawings in, in this book. It would have been me. <laughs> and those lines, those are one things about that book that's not changed. But when I've had Dick Korf, a mycologist who was here at Cornell for years, review those, he said, don't change a thing. They're, 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 you can't be improved upon. Can you think about it? Of all the hand drawings that she put in there, a fungi in this book, how long that took to do that? There's um, black and white pictures like powder mildew like that in the book. There's some more line drawings. And they're perfectly done. Very, very well done. She did her look up look at them under a scope, microscope, and they look just exactly as she drew them. I haven't seen this technology. There's some color color pictures in. Now most of these color pictures of course are Issues. She didn't have color in the book. And some of the black and white are pictures that I put in there are ones that she didn't have. Um, but the one kind of images that I could not improve upon, nor would I change, are the hand drawings. Uh, I can't imagine how much time that took for her to do that. But there's some really nice color 
So, like I said, you know, you, you, have, you have to, uh, some, of these are, some of these diseases are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> right, Helene? They are. I love this watch. <laughs> it's awful. Yeah. Even some of those rats are too bad. <laughs> you might disagree with me on that. Now, this is the last chapter. You can go through the uh, chapters like this, and all the individual plants are highlighted in, in blue leaf. And you have chestnut here. There was somebody earlier here that was interested in chestnut. Interestingly enough, chestnut is pretty resistant. There aren't many really diseases reported on chestnut. If you go to roses, you get a, a little more than two pages, I think, of diseases on roses. Uh, there, so you get a, a really a good idea so here's pine. Now look at pine. I think there's, there's one page, two, three, four, four and a half pages of diseases on pine. Did you say, I mean, that there are a number of diseases that expand. Do you think it's that uh, kind of our ability to figure out what diseases are out there is just gotten better? That's so part of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's part of it, for sure. We've gotten better at recognizing diseases and new diseases that are coming on board and that are out there. <coughs> yeah. sure. Does it apply to the United States or the whole world? I was just going to comment on that. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, this book initially uh, mainly concentrated on the U.S. because that was her travel. Those, that was Cynthia Westcott's travels. But I expanded it to include South America and Canada, so it's mostly North American diseases. Interestingly enough, uh, Springer's been, they probably did the best job of uh, uh, putting the book together. The designs and stuff they put in there are, are probably the best that I've had. Four editions that I've got. <coughs> Springer's already talked to me about an eighth edition. I'm supposed to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that had, they said it's amazing, they got you know, probably the quickest reviews on any, on any of the books that they put out. This book, and they, and they were pretty nice reviews. There was a very extensive review done on the book in the, uh, Europe, uh, the European Journal of Horticultural Science. <coughs> and they said, even though this book only covers diseases basically in the North American area, North and South America area, most of these diseases do occur on crops in Europe. And for the most part, they said this book is considered somewhat the Bible. It's kind of It's kind of scary. Uh, yes. So it, you've done all the work to do this new edition. Can you imagine a scenario for a future edition that could be done in a Wikipedia type mode with a collaborative contribution process? Springer probably would. <laughs> well, I raised the question that borders on what you're kind of driving at. And I spoke with her, with her, uh, her a little bit recently. Uh, before we went on, you'll notice something in the, in the flyer. <coughs> this book is getting larger and larger. There's the first edition, and you saw this, this edition here. The weight's quite a bit different. That book was made. Uh, in such a fashion and was kind of designed so that people could carry it with them into the garden. <laughs> you don't carry this book very far. As a matter of fact, this review on the uh, European Journal of Horticultural Science said the book is getting a little heavy. It's very difficult to carry something like this in the field uh, for identifying diseases. Now, we're getting heavy to carry. It's getting expensive to buy. Thirty-two fifty, and first one that I did. Uh, I think it got a four hundred dollar price on this, three hundred and ninety-nine dollars. Of course, textbooks have gone, <coughs> but you know this book isn't going to get smaller as you continue to add to it. It's become. I, I raised the question with, what do you do to handle 
a problem like this because ultimately, right now, it's at the point where somebody can't just pick it up and carry the field. Now they can take their laptop because there's an e-reference uh, form of it, but the laptop doesn't bring up everything to it that uh, a hard copy does. Uh, Russell, it's almost out of reach for gardeners. It's out of reach. Yeah. Gardeners, yeah. home gardeners can't afford it anymore. Garden, and that was what she designed it for. Yeah, public, even public libraries think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Public libraries. What do you do? Coral plantations. Coral so, <laughs> <laughs> plantations. What do you do? You can't. So I asked ask the librarian, what do you do with something? What's the answer? I ask you, what, what do you do? What's the answer to this? How do you, how, how do you keep? It's, it's a value, but it's getting out of hand. Such as? Section it up into plant families. And, uh, we want the iPhone app back here. <laughs> <laughs> One of the thoughts that came to mind. Well, look, any other ideas, suggestions? Well, could you separate out what like, yeah. you suggesting? Flowers and vegetable crops yeah. and tree crops. Those are like the compendium. Field crops. Yeah, it's like the compendium. Well, that's one of the things that we've that has been looked at right now. As a matter of fact, Springer had asked me when we talked to them. I, felt, I, you know, I raised this question to Springer because they started making noise about the eighth edition. I said, wait a <laughs> With waterproof pages. Yeah, <laughs> waterproof pages. Uh, but Springer said, and also, in regard to the comment that was made by that review, how about field manuals? Well, then I got to think about it. You know, you could take, you could, you could make field manuals, a field manual. Matter of fact, I, I kind of listed. You could do a field manual on fruit and berry crops. You could do a fruit manual of vegetable crops, one on field crops, one on ornamental crops, one on trees and shrubs. One of nut crops, so you can make a field map, break it off into field maps. Okay. Well, isn't it true that like diseases? I mean, you start to get used to some of the problems with diseases really have to be multiply identified in the lab. And most of them. They, they, they have they quote this diagnostic labs quote this. As a matter of fact, I had a call from the University of Tennessee when the first. Preliminary uh, flyer came out about the book as in the process of the book. And the guy from the University of Tennessee said, Well, my dad is sitting here doing my third history, so I've already put my order in for an ego. See, they can be, you know, this is chat with stacks, now you're not in stacks. But how many, how many of you walk through the stacks? How many students do you see in the stacks? They're sitting out at the computer. So maybe we don't need a hard copy. We're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're not sure. It's quite possible. It's quite possible. I mean, it does, a computerized version adds things like being able to search through the text. You know, so you can look for the occurrence of a particular disease no matter where it is. We bought it as a part of a larger package of Springer books, so I don't know individually. I, well, I think that the brochure, I think they've got the same charge on their e-references that they have on the I would suggest that you go back to the model of the first edition. And instead of being all encompassing, provide a guide or especially considering, I mean, since Obama's putting in a vegetable garden all this kind of thing, I mean, I think there there will be a whole new generation of people who are just starting and don't know anything about farming, with less than one percent of people having anything. Maybe it's time to go back. But the, I mean, I work in public horticulture, and it's, you know, 
But I agree with that. What Just saying that for the person on the street, it, it's too I'm much. Have a short, needs a version. But then the, the sort of the subset of the version oh, is sort of too like, yeah, backyard version. Well, it's nice in that he uses as a teaching thing, but that's the version. He's on the video on some so, you said new diseases are emerging. Do any of them ever go away? Do they ever, <laughs> do they ever just sort of yeah. evolve themselves out of, out of uh, any? No, and, you know, that's a, that's a really good question. And, you know, I can't think of any that will go away. Um, get enough modification of the plant systems that they always find new things on which they survive very readily. Do you, can you think of any that have disappeared? I can't think of any that have gone away, and I, I'm thinking of late flight came back. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. The bus, look at the bus. Yeah, rust is back. Yeah. I can't think of any that have I noticed that there was like chickweed in that book in, in New Samoa, so also for, for um, possibly finding some wild fungicides. I mean, nobody really wants to grow chickweed. So maybe, so it would seem to me that that would be reference would also be good nowadays for, you know, well, wild fungicides. I mean, there's a, there's something that you would grow to keep the disease. Yeah, it's something you would develop to, yeah. But you know, if you look up, if you look in here, you know, chickweed. Yeah, to, I mean, something you would, you could use, like you could find a pathogen that grows on chickweed and develop. To control. To control. Oh, control. Yeah. Uh, that, I think it has, hasn't there been some effort along those lines? There has been yeah. the, the people that have looked at rusts for control of weeds. Yeah. And they've looked at the organic farming community. Yeah. It's done things like that. I think so that Tony also looked at um, which rust was what's the line. Yeah. 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 Is there a West, West, West pot? So you mentioned that you've already accumulated 180 some 280 <coughs> new occurrences or something. How do you keep up? How do you find out about these things. What are your mechanisms for watching journals? <laughs> I watch those journals. Every month I watch journals. So you're, yeah. you're browsing the, the journals for yeah. Yeah. But you, you know, know interestingly what? enough, one, at one point Springer said, why not make this real wide as well? Find somebody else, not me. <laughs> not me. Worldwide. Worldwide in terms of Westcott used to write a uh, gardening article in the New York Times. Yes. Yes. Fantastic reads. Did, had, did they approach you early on to continue that? Or, mm -hmm. I mean, because that's a big gap for plant ecology, yeah. I think, that it's such a, a great site. They have some fun else to yeah. I did, uh, no, you know, I give invitations to give talks. Uh, well, I believe that I wanted to go to natural. New Hampshire for a regional rose society. And they got a program for the Southern Peoples. Uh, we went to Denver last year for the National Peace. They, they had a good number of people turn out for that. And that's kind of fun. But, uh, I've never done any popular like this. Uh, uh, New York Times hasn't, thought, hasn't approached me. <laughs> I think they've got their own problems right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Ken. Sure. My pleasure. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.